Welcome back to Physical Chemistry on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In some of the previous videos, we've talked about phase diagrams, and I think I mentioned in those videos that this part of physical chemistry was my least favorite. Um, it can be kind of confusing. Um, phase diagrams can be somewhat complicated in this course. Hopefully try to break this down and we're going to talk about the Clausius-Clapeyron equation in this video. I'm going to derive this equation. Um, the Clausius-Clapeyron equation is shown down here. Okay, But in order to get the Clausius-Clapeyron equation, we first have to get the Clapeyron equation. Okay, The Clapeyron equation um, is used for a slightly different purpose than the Clausius-Clapeyron equation, although they are very closely related. All right, so I've got a phase diagram shown down here. The phase diagram is given as a function of pressure on the vertical axis and temperature on the horizontal axis. Okay, And I have in the lighter color up here, phase one. I don't care what phase it is, just any phase. And then down here in the darker color, we have phase two. Okay, Now, if we're on this red line right here, this is the boundary between these two phases. Anywhere on this line, Phase one and phase two are in equilibrium with each other. And really when we're at equilibrium, we mean that the pressure is not changing and the temperature is not changing. Both of these are at equilibrium along that red line. Okay, And remember that uh, when you're at equilibrium, we say the chemical potentials of phase one and of phase two are equal. Chemical potential, recall, is given by the Greek symbol mu. I've got a couple mu's up here in some equations, which we'll get to. Um, chemical potential, or mu, recall, is the free energy divided by the number of moles, so G divided by N. So in some ways, you could think of mu, or the chemical potential, as a molar free energy, kind of like we had molar volume, molar entropy, and so forth. Chemical potential is a molar free energy. It's G divided by N. Okay, but when two phases are in equilibrium with each other, we say that their chemical potentials are equal. In other words, we say that mu1, or the chemical potential of phase 1, is equal to the chemical potential of phase 2, or mu2. All right. Now, suppose we're at point A on this phase diagram. So that's on this red line at a point where phase 1 and phase 2 are in equilibrium. Let's suppose I wanted to move from point A to point B. Okay, so if I move from point A to point B, notice that both the pressure is going to increase and the temperature is going to increase. Okay, and I'm assuming for this purpose that this movement, it's actually blown up a lot here, but these two points are very, very, very close together. Okay, in fact, the distance you would travel vertically is dp, just a, an infinitesimally small change in pressure, and the amount that you would actually move along the horizontal axis is a very small temperature dt, an infinitesimally small temperature. Okay, so these two points are not very far from each other, but if I move from point A to point B, um, I want uh, the two phases to remain in equilibrium. So the way I would denote that is an infinitely, infinitesimally small change in mu1 would have to be equal to an infinitesimally small change in mu2. So d mu1 equals d mu2. Okay, so I put this in differential notation. All right. Now, what I'm going to do from here is I'm going to expand out each differential. And you've probably done this in a chapter where you covered partial derivatives and thermodynamics. So recalling that each of these chemical potentials are functions of pressure and temperature here, I can expand mu1 as follows, or d mu1. So it's the partial of mu1 with respect to pressure at constant temperature times dp, plus the partial of mu1 with respect to temperature at constant pressure dt. Okay, so that's the left side of this equation for mu1. So now I'm essentially going to do the same thing on the right side, except it's going to be for d mu2. So I'm going to have the partial of mu2 with respect to p, or pressure, at constant temperature times dp, plus the partial derivative of mu2 with respect to t at constant p times dt. The only difference between the right side here and the left side should be the subscripts on the mu. So the right side should have 1, the right side should have two. These ones and twos correspond to these two phases down here in the diagram. Okay. Now, obviously we don't have a function for chemical potential, so we can't just differentiate this with respect to P. So we're going to use what are called Maxwell relations. And in a previous video very long ago, and probably in your course, you covered some of the derivation of these Maxwell relations. Now, we had a Maxwell relation that looked very similar to this first one. It was the partial of G, 
with respect to p at constant t is equal to v. Okay, without this line over it, just v. So that was one of our Maxwell relations. But recall, and I mentioned this a few minutes ago, that chemical potential is simply g divided by n. It's the free energy divided by the number of moles. So if I took what was partial of g with respect to p at constant t and divide through by n, now I have the partial of mu with respect to p at constant t, and then I would have volume divided by n, and that's a molar volume. So whenever you see this line above a quantity like this, that implies we're dealing with a molar quantity. Okay, so this is molar volume. In the past, we used a previous nomenclature where we put the quantity V and then like a subscript M or N. Um, that would be a molar quantity. That's one way. This is a second way we can put a molar quantity. Okay? Now, we also had a second Maxwell relation. It was the partial of G with respect to T at constant P equals negative entropy or negative S. But in the same way, if we replace... Uh, mu, uh, the g with mu, which means dividing both sides by the number of moles, we get the partial of mu with respect to t at constant p is equal to negative molar s. Okay, again, the line over that means we have a molar quantity. And pretty much all I'm going to do is find these corresponding partial derivatives, okay, in this expansion right here that I just made, and I'm going to replace them with their molar quantity and with the appropriate subscript. And so ultimately what I get, for example, if I have the partial of mu1 with respect to p at constant t, I can replace all of this with molar volume, but it's going to be molar volume 1. And so if I do that with each one of these partial derivatives, there's four of them, I get the molar volume 1 times dp minus molar entropy 1 dt, equals molar volume 2 dp minus molar entropy 2 dt. All right, so that's where I get this. And from here, I can actually, uh, first of all, divide through both sides by dt. Okay, And I'm going to neglect the actual algebra of this. But it suffices to say if you divide both sides through by dt and then group the entropy terms and group the volume terms, you can actually rearrange it into this equation down here, which is now a differential equation. It's the derivative of pressure with respect to temperature, dp dt, is equal to the change in molar entropy divided by the change in molar volume. Okay, so this is almost at the Clapeyron equation. Now, the molar entropy or the change in it, I should say, is somewhat of a difficult quantity to measure. We would want to put this in terms of something else that's easier to measure. So recall that any entropy, let's say S, is just equal to the corresponding enthalpy H divided by T. Okay? So we can substitute out this change in molar entropy for the change in molar enthalpy, delta H molar, divided by T. And so by making that substitution, I can get this into what's called the Clapeyron equation, which is dp dt equals the change in molar enthalpy, delta H molar, divided by temperature, divided by the change in molar volume. And this right here is the Clapeyron equation. Okay, we're going to need this to ultimately get the clausius clapeyron equation, but we're going to spend a little bit of time here and talk about what the Clapeyron equation is used for. Generally speaking, the Clapeyron equation predicts the slope of the tangent line of the boundary between solid and liquid phases. Okay, so the key here is solid and liquid phases. So for example, again, this is probably not true in this phase diagram. I'm just making this up. But suppose that... Uh, this phase up here, phase one, let's say that was a solid, okay? And then let's say down here was a liquid. Okay, down here is the liquid, all right? So if I uh, knew what the enthalpy of fusion was, right, because the, the phase change between solid and liquid would be fusion or melting, if you wanted to look at it that way, if I knew what the enthalpy of that process was, and I knew what the change in molar volume was, because remember, whenever you actually melt a substance into its liquid form, the volume is going to change a little bit, okay? Just a little bit. It's going to be a very small change. But if I knew that enthalpy, that change in molar volume, and the temperature that I was operating at, 
um, I could figure out therefore what the slope of this boundary is. Okay, And actually the clapper on equation is actually how you predict what the slope of this line is. And one of the applications of the clapper on equation is you can use it to solve for one of these two variables if you don't know it. For example, you can use it to solve for the enthalpy of fusion or melting depending which direction you're going. Um, the molar enthalpy that is, or you could use it if you didn't know it to solve for the change in molar volume. But this dp dt, that's the slope of this boundary right here. And specifically the Clapeyron equation is going to be used for predicting that uh, slope um, for the boundary between solid and liquid phases. That's the Clapeyron equation.